we can start now our Latin American seminar, Perspectives on Post-Pandemic. I am Saulo José Casale Bahia. I am trustee of the World Academy of Art and Science, fellow from this society. Uh, uh, I am Brazilian. I'm federal judge and professor here in Brazil. And I have the great honor to uh, start to our, our meeting. It's uh, the idea was born between some uh, Brazilian fellows, Latin American fellows. We don't have it in our World Academy of Art and Science a formal chapter, Latin American chapter. We have uh, only uh, a formal group of fellows, and uh, we thought that we could uh, uh, produce some uh, kind of uh, event to discuss this then the post-pandemic perspectives. It is very, very uh, important to the World Academy. When the World Academy uh, celebrated uh, its uh, 60 uh, anniversary birthday uh, on last February, uh, there was a big event uh, called a Planetary Moment in February, uh, the, where the Academy was found 60 years ago. Geneva, and uh, the pandemic, the post-pandemic perspectives were discussed inside the, the, the meeting. And also in our Board of Trustee meeting in March, we decided to, to enable a project. We call this project Managing Pandemics. And for this reason, we invited the three the fellows that are involved with this, this project, Malaysian Pandemics, Thomas Reuter, uh, Emil Constantinescu from Romania, Thomas from Germany, and Fadwa that came from Egypt to be with us in our meeting. So we, this meeting, it's an official meeting of the World Academy of Art and Science. And uh, for this, we decided to use the English language, not properly the Portuguese or the Spanish language. It will be easier to us to use Portuguese or Spanish, but we decided to use the English to acquire a wider range of, uh, of the public, of audience, and to to the English is the official language of the World Academy, so we decided to use it. And all the records, all the speeches, all the contributions from the panelists or from the audience will be available on YouTube and at the website of the World Academy, worldacademy.org. And uh, for this reason, we decided, we, we knew that we could lose some some, uh, some uh, interested uh, people, but we 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 ag we agreed that we agreed that it was important to 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 communicate ourselves in a universal language like an English. It, it will be useful, very important. So the idea was initially to put uh, Latin American fellows or, or people that could be interested in take part in some events or even to be fellow in the future in the academy together uh, to know each other and share experience to be together. And uh, I believe that we acquired this goal when we, we received the affirmative uh, answer from 27 uh, people that will be with us 
in these three days of uh, event, and we will just wish we will discuss law, democracy, and society, education, science, and innovation, economy and development, and environment and right to health, 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 and the perspective of the pandemic of COVID-19. So I believe that uh, uh, it was a success to join all these panelists, scientists, artists, and thinkers that will be with us sharing uh, their ideas, their, their thoughts about the, 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 these perspectives about pandemics. And uh, we, we are very happy to be now with a person that is our, our manager of uh, the World Academy of Art and Science. He, uh, who is an American social scientist and business consultant, is president and CEO of the World Academy of Art and Science, chairman and CEO of the World University Consortium also, full member of the Club of Rome, executive editor of Academy's journal, and president of the Modern Society, Seth's Society in India, where he lives nowadays, Gary Jacobs. He will be with us with the role to give to us the introduction for our meeting. To, he will be the first speaker. And uh, the idea is to give to us a general idea about our problem that we will discuss in these three days. And I would like to, after introducing you, my colleague, uh, Gary, uh, to, I need to give to you the floor. And uh, I, I would like to say more than time, our happiness to, to be with you, to see you again, and your, your dis, uh, disposition to participate, to stay with us in our meeting, in our official meeting of the World Academy. So uh, with us, Mr. Garrett Jacobs, the floor is yours. Salo, thank you very much for the introduction. And my thanks to you and all of our friends and the Brazilian representatives who have gone to taken this initiative to organize this meeting. Uh, the topic is so important and so timely. Uh, as you said, we've already had a lengthy discussion of it just back in February. And it's been a topic we've been looking at over the last one year as events unfolded. But I think the topic you've chosen is, is very appropriate uh, because as much as we are filled with the news on a day-to-day -day basis and the news is not very encouraging, uh, you and I uh, are situated in the second and third uh, countries most affected uh, by the pandemic right now. Uh, and if we look at it in a larger perspective, uh, this event is an unprecedented event uh, uh, in the last century. Uh, the, we've had, we've seen about 3.3 million deaths, but just to tell you what it's like here, uh, three months ago, uh, we had 10,000 cases, new cases a day. Uh, and now we have more than 400,000. So it, it has gone 40 times in three months. And who can say uh, what will happen in the future? So these are really unprecedented times. But I think you very wisely said we're going to focus on the post-pandemic topics today because everybody is, the media is full of what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis and we know it. But in order to do that, I'd like to put this in a little perspective before we go to the future uh, and before I touch on some of the issues of the future. I think we all realize that the pandemic was only the latest and most dramatic 
development of a whole series of very, very challenging developments that have unfolded in the last four or five years. Uh, it, one of the immediate consequences, of course, has been not only uh, uh, fatalities and health problems, but uh, uh, very serious problems of food insecurity, uh, problems of economic slowdown and uh, income, uh, loss of incomes, rising levels of unemployment, rising levels of human insecurity in all respects, not just in a health uh, respect. And that's not all either, of course. Many of you are, most of our friends are from the field of education. And we know this is massively dislocated education at all levels all over the world. And I think it's important to realize even World War II probably didn't affect as much of the world as, uh, as the pandemic is doing because it's infecting people in every country of the world at every age uh, in that time even before the pandemic set in. Uh, in America and in many other countries, we had a number of other very serious developments which are important to keep in mind for the post-pandemic period. We had a retreat from democracy towards autocracy in many countries and in many different forms. Uh, we've had a polarization of society very badly and seriously, we've seen it in America. We've had a return to competitive nationalism. We've had a resurgence of focus on national security and military spending and armaments uh, spending. Uh, we had a weakening and undermining of the multilateral system at precisely the time when we needed it most. And we've had a severe decline in trust and confidence in public institutions, in national governments, in uh, corporations, and particularly in the media and the news media where the, the ratings and, uh, have gone so low. So it's, when we're talking about the future, we have to remember that it's not just uh, a, a virus that we're dealing with. We're dealing with a whole confluence uh, of factors that were there before that were building up and have been aggravated by the pandemic but we'll still need to be dealt with as we go further. Uh, uh, but it, it, not all the news is bad. And again, I think it's important when we talk about the future that we should also realize that uh, we should not just look bad, back on what the troubles have been, but we should also note some very significant recent developments. Uh, as an American, I can't help mentioning uh, November 3rd elections in the US and there's been a sea change uh, in many areas of policy uh, in the US since then, uh, very important to the whole world. You know, pandemic, however serious it is, is nothing compared to the threat of climate change, which is an infinitely greater challenge to the whole world. There are great similarities in it. And finally, the US has returned to the Paris Accord and taken, taking very serious steps to catch up and make up for lost time. Uh, we've seen uh, the US and Russia entered into the New, New START Treaty, a five-year extension of the limits on intercontinental uh, weapons, which was just about to be canceled. So we were really on the verge of a very serious backward step. We had the signing into effect, thanks to Honduras, of the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which has been in the process of ratification for the last, since 2017, and finally the 50th country ratified it. An unprecedented agreement on trying to ban these weapons. We've had a dramatic fall in the price of solar. Uh, we've had a, a, a dramatic increase in recognition that the future is in, is in solar and electricity and non uh, fossil in, in, in renewable energies, even uh, the drama of, of General Motors announcing very recently to everybody's surprise that in five years they're phasing out uh, petroleum based uh, uh, cars uh, with something inconceivable uh, just six months ago. We had things like BlackRock, the, the biggest investment house in the world, saying, announcing that they are disinvesting from fossil fuels and those industries that are damaging the environment coming out finally uh, after so much of pressure for so long. 
an unprecedented announcement. And we even had the World Economic Forum finally saying that shareholder value is not the, the purpose of being in business. We have to take care of all stakeholders. I think these are not things we should lose sight of. And the reason I'm emphasizing them is uh, because as serious as the problem is, and as serious as our future challenges are, this is also a time of great opportunity. And if we understand why some of these positive things are happening, we also, we can ch challenge ourselves to, with the question, which I hope we will be dealing with during this conference is, how do we leverage the magnitude and intensity of the challenges that the world is facing to convert them into opportunities? How do we leverage the pressure of the pandemic uh, to really push for paradigmic, paradigmic change? And I'd like to briefly in the rest of my comments indicate some of the areas where I think not only that paradigm change is necessary, but it is feasible. And we need, we almost need the pressure of a pandemic to force us out of our inertia, our vested interests, our complacency, uh, and all, and really make, uh, make significant uh, changes. Uh, one of them, the, the first I'd like to mention, and these are all issues that the World Academy has been dealing with, uh, in, especially in the last one year in our project in collaboration with the United Nations in Geneva. We call it global leadership in the 21st century. But as you know, we only began a process of, of, of looking into the future and looking at how we can make this paradigm change. And I'm very happy that we have meetings like this and in your initiative that can help us take that, that work further because that's the work on the agenda of the Academy for the next year or two. Uh, the first major change I think we, uh, and something we're very concerned with and involved in is in the very concept of security. It's time for us to really seriously redefine what we mean by security. And the pandemic is a dramatic example of that. Uh, and of course, the climate is a far, far more dramatic example of that. But we still have nation states stuck in this paradigm that security means national security uh, supported by increasing military budgets. What good is our $2 trillion in military spending today doing to save millions of lives? to save and feed people who need it, to create jobs for people, to protect the environment for, and for the future. And we, the UN is working on this paradigm of human security. We need a, 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 the redefinition we need is really human security, not national security. Human security, which covers all facets and dimensions of human life in terms of human rights, in terms of social equity, in terms of opportunity, economic, uh, political, health, uh, uh, nutrition, food, uh, uh, democracy. It needs to be a comprehensive view. And the Academy is working now. Uh, and we just finished a survey for the United Nations on, uh, for the United Nations Human Security Unit on views of parliamentarians, civil society organizations, uh, 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 academicians, uh, academies around the world on attitudes and recognition of this fact. And the data shows without question that there's a big shift in emphasis and recognition that we need a comprehensive view like this on human security. And the UN is activating their efforts on this concept. It's a, it's a 25 year old concept, but they're now bringing it to the fore because they also feel this is really an opportunity for us uh, to change the definition. Second very important issue I'm not going to dwell on because we spent a year discussing it in our, our UN project, but I think it's important to put it on the table. We need to reinvent multilateralism because the pandemic has come at a time when the emphasis on multilateralism was in retreat. Our, we were withdrawing our uh, effort and our attention and our funding and support and going back to national level activity. And we've been faced with a crisis which can only be tackled, can only be tackled when we tackle it together. It doesn't matter how hard some country fights uh, uh, on the pandemic. 
But until we get rid of this thing, until we protect people all over the world, nobody is really safe unless you're going to just close all the borders and go into a vacuum. And still we won't be safe because the whole world economy, economy is held in hostage by this. World global travel is held in hostage by this. So we just need a serious effort to try to redefine our multilateralism in a much more inclusive fashion. And we talk about the role for civil society in it, the role for academia and science in it, the role for business uh, and the role for, uh, for uh, other organizations as well. In fact, just three weeks ago, we had an event, we call it Boss Talk, where we looked at three proposals for redefining, uh, opening up the UN system to let in much greater voice of civil society, uh, which is a civil society is a much stronger entity in the world society than it was even 20 years ago. No comparison uh, with the status when, uh, when we were in the, the beginning, the, when, it was, when the UN was founded. And we talked about three proposals for that. I'm not going to mention them again, but I would like to mention one that's hot on the agenda for us now. We think that global society needs a voice. Humanity has no voice today. Unless we consider the voices of our national governments and the politicians in national government when they go to the UN and say, we will not eradicate nuclear weapons and we're not going to band together on climate or whatever it is, unless we consider that the voice. There's no direct voice for humanity. And we think it's really important that humanity begins to hear, we begin to hear each other. We need a mirror so we can hear what the rest of the world is thinking, not just what national governments and diplomats are thinking uh, in the General Assembly and the Security Council. Another very important area, which we'll all agree, is economy. Uh, and the changes that I alluded to earlier are, are very significant because the Academy has been working for a decade on the argument that we really need to challenge fundamentals of economic thinking. And some of our colleagues here, like Jonilio, have been pioneers and, uh, and strong out of advocates of this for decades. And this is really the time we need to do that. Uh, we need to challenge uh, the way money is being invested. And the Academy is working on two projects now, one looking at how private sector investment can be redirected towards uh, the, uh, the SDGs and sustainable development. And a report was released at our December conference on that, uh, showing what 30 top financial institutions in the world are doing to change their policies and their investment priorities. And we have another uh, report coming up in about four months, about 100 top financial institutions of their changes and their commitments they're willing to make. At the same time, we have to change the priorities and the financing of public institutions and governments. And we have a project on that headed by Stefan Brunhuber on how governments can generate using, uh, I won't go into it, but using uh, direct financing created by the central banks uh, through cryptocurrencies, money to finance the SDGs and climate change. It's another effort and we need many more like this. At the same time, we really have to examine opportunities for wide scale generation of employment. And we have a project in the academy we've been speaking about on employment guarantee programs. And the, the crux of this is the evidence that it's cheaper to create a job than it is to leave people unemployed. The costs, the social costs and economic costs of rising levels of unemployment and the political costs and instability arising are simply too great uh, for us. So we need a change in thinking and we need a change in policy. And I'm emphasizing this because that sounded completely unrealistic three years ago. But now already we see the neoliberal philosophy is under threat. Governments are practicing new policies that would have been completely discredited a few years ago. And we need to take the momentum of COVID to break through and prove that alternative policies can really work. And we see that happening in Europe. We see it happening in the US. It, it, it's, it's happening in many countries and it needs to happen more. Uh, 
I'd like to just mention briefly a few more areas that I hope you're gonna to touch on. I believe you are gonna to touch on. One is education because the pandemic has completely thrown the global educational system uh, into chaos. It shut down vast amounts of the system from higher education all the way down to, to kindergarten. And I think it's a big mistake if we just simply wait. We don't know how long we're gonna to have to wait, but even to wait until the COVID's over so we can go back to business as usual in education. This is a great opportunity for us because we have proven during this one year that online learning, that technology-based learning, it's not a full replacement for, for, uh, for classroom uh, learning for sure, but it can do some things much better and more effectively and at much lower cost than the classroom and this is a time for the revolution that we had hoped would start about six, seven years ago, uh, but the resistance of universities to a change in pedagogy and a change in delivery system was so great. Now it's being compelled on universities all over the world. It's being compelled on even schools, uh, all the way, uh, uh, grade schools all over the world as well. We shouldn't think of waiting so we can get back. We should learn the positive lessons and learn how to do it better and really come out with a new paradigm that will deliver a better quality, lower cost education uh, to many people who don't get it at all today. And then finally, we're challenged by democracy, problems of democracy. We really have to look for new solutions for generating reliable information because without reliable information, science is under threat. The, the credibility of science is under threat. Uh, our media is doing as much more pollution than they are education now uh, with the kind of information that's flowing through it. We need to come up with new ideas like one we've been pushing in the academy for a global rating agency for the credibility of information that's, that's coming from different organizations. And of course, the environmental issue is so big, uh, I think it, it adds up to all of these. I would only like to flag one more, that, and that is the governance of technology. We see growing concern about the tremendous power of a, the concentration of power in a few technology organizations. We have another program coming up on the 24th in the Academy on the governance of technology for social welfare, ethics, and equity. And again, I think that the thinking in the world is changing now where this is not just a neoliberal free-for-all anymore. We have to ask ourselves and ensure that our technology is really uh, generating, delivering human welfare and, uh, and well-being as well. So with that, I'd like to stop and congratulate uh, our friends for organizing this meeting and looking forward very much to the presentations and discussion in the next three days. Thank you. Thank you, Jagger. Thank you very much. Uh, your general idea or vision about pandemic was, was perfect for this introduction uh, for our meeting. Uh, we will discuss economics, we will discuss uh, health, we will discuss all these perspectives that you built to us during these three days. And uh, tomorrow we will start at nine o'clock. Uh, with a break, but today we will work without a break. <laughs> we start uh, uh, the session one immediately. But I, I have to introduce to all the audience the organizing committee. We have here Daniele Sanji Pinheiro. So she is on the screen. We have uh, Eito Gugolino, not yet participating, he will be at our closing session. Neandro uh, Saavedra Rivan, he is with his beautiful beach behind you, him. Uh, Eron Gordilho, it's present here. And also Joanilho Rodolfo Teixeira from Brasilia is on the screen also. So, uh, we, we 
are the organizing community, and we invited all the Latin American fellows to be to take part of this meeting, and most uh, agreed and uh, joined joined with us to to this meeting. We, we will be together. We will hear all of them in the next uh, today and uh, tomorrow and after tomorrow. So we need to start immediately. Thank you, thank you, Gary very much. Stay with us.